What makes you think I am calm? What it's... makes you think I'm not stressed underneath it all? It's your presence, it's your external. And it did get to a point where I was depressed and I didn't enjoy coaching. I did enjoy coaching, but I didn't enjoy other job role that you have to do as a business owner. Yes. Eventually. It was fun yeah. at the start. In hindsight, it was a mistake, but I think it was a trial that I needed to go through. I would say hundreds of clients, if not 90% of all of my clients, they'll come into the gym tired at least once and I'll ask, are you okay, you had a stressful day, and it's always to do with work. And I always say, why don't you get a different job? Yeah. And it's almost like people have, I'm generalizing here, but it's almost like they've got so much expenses on the mortgage and the car payment, and or trying to keep up with other people in terms of clothes and holidays, things yeah. like that. It's such a material way of living your life. Yeah. You probably can't change job. Everyone's life tends to go through several stages, mm. and films and and novels tend to follow the same pattern. Basically, you have a protagonist, which is me or you. You live in your comfortable life at home, blah, 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 and then you get called to adventure, and then you go out on that adventure, and you go through your own trials and tribulations. And so the end of the hero's journey is you reach your gift, or you realize what you can add to the community mm. or to the wider world. Then you go back home, where you started from, yeah, but you brought rebuild. that gift with you. Today's episode is with one of my very good friends, Ant Shaw. We go back quite some time, actually. Um, I met Ant years ago at Mastermind. Um, I used to look up to him in his gym um, sort of facility, and he was really who I was modeling as a gym, uh, looking back years and years ago. Um, we become really good friends of the Mo Mastermind. He lives in Manchester, but we kept in, you know, in contact a lot. Um, but he, had, for me, he's a very calm person, a very interesting person and somebody that I you know I look up to a lot and you know I I like I like the way he um, is calm in life I always I always say he's you know he's a very calming person to me and I I love the way that Ant has this lion mind mentality if you want to call it that you know he's always pushing forward he's always pursuing the next the next thing and today's podcast really was really powerful to to explain you know his struggles that he's been through you know he's been from a, 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 a working in a bank if you want to start right back there um, to set up his own gym that he visioned and that he wanted to be one day finally got to that point and then took a complete u-turn in life um, but i won't explain any more of that than, than you diving into the episode um, and as well a, a really interesting part is his dad was ex sas um, so the, the, the podcast is a wicked podcast. Enjoy the podcast. Um, and please, please, as always, share as much as possible because we've had some amazing feedback. I had a really, really nice message a couple of days ago um, on the podcast and it really fires me up to, to do more and help more people. So enjoy the podcast and please share it amongst your friends. Guys, I just want to stop there and take your attention just for one moment. But I want to shout out to Silverback Gymwear who are sponsoring this event. Now, for the guys who don't know who they are, you must have been living under a rock. But Silverback have honestly, since I've used their stuff, I've realized how good quality gym gear can be. And quite simply, like, the, you know, this is one of the t-shirts, one of the hats here. Um, but their, their quality is beyond what your typical gym wear is i'm the sort of person that if i'm honest wouldn't really go out and buy gym wear however i went out my way to buy this simply because i felt the quality and just to throw it in there the designs are super cool so if you haven't already been to them go to the website there's a link below where you can get a discount um but go and get yourself some and be amongst the rest of the people so that you can be as cool as them and actually hit some PRs in the gym. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, as always, for all the support so far. Um, please, please continue to share, like, and, you know, maybe even if you listen to a, an episode one day and you think it would help somebody else that you may think is not listening to the Line Mind podcast at the minute, please share it to them. Um, and if you really, really want to be a, a massive help and then get them to give us a five star rating as well. Um, but today I've got a very, very good friend of mine 
um, who I'm excited to bring on, and he thinks he thinks he's not got that much to bring to the table, but we will see because I know he's a very interesting person. He's just being super humble and chilled because that is exactly how he is as a person. Um, but today we've got Ant Shaw. Or should I call you Anthony to make it a little bit more? Whatever you like. <laughs> you call me what Sounds you like. more professional. It does, doesn't it? Okay, cut, go again. So Anthony Shaw. Uh, I don't think I've ever called you Anthony. I think I'd be angry with you if I did that. Yeah, nobody does. That, no. <laughs> but Ant, obviously uh, we go back a long way and we've got lots to share. And thank you for taking your time to come over to see me. Cause My pleasure. We always talk, but it's hard to get to get face-to-face sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But no, I appreciate you coming over, man. Um, just tell... Just tell the listeners just quickly to sort of like who you are, why probably a brief bit of why we met. We'll go into detail, um, and and yeah, and just you know just what Ant does nowadays. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, so originally from South Wales, moved up to Manchester to play rugby. Uh, Two thousand and six, did my sports science degree whilst I was playing rugby. Ended up coaching at Salford and not making it as a rugby player. So we can talk about. <laughs> disappointment <laughs> or delusion depending on how you want to see it so after I finished uh, uni I coached for a year in professional sport and then I started my own gym in 2010 called Raw Strength Gym which is still going to this day so I've had the the entrepreneurial highs and lows of, of doing that mm. um, I wasn't full time at it at first I kind of was part time with like a normal job and did the gym in the early mornings and evenings and weekends things like that built it up from scratch um, and then after Covid kind of downsized it and my girlfriend Sarah took over and turned it to a powerlifting gym and I kind of got burnt out from coaching from 2006 all the way through to, to 2020 mm. um, 2021 after we got the, the new smaller gym up and running after Covid I decided to leave the fitness industry and do anything <laughs> just to have like a break really yeah and also to to try and afford to buy a house because of all the mortgage legislation that was changing it was quite difficult when you're self-employed to have uh, a mortgage they, they needed a bigger deposit basically mm. so i just thought i was just gonna get a normal job yeah so i thought about what to do and end up doing my hgv license and i've been a trucker for nearly two years now which is <laughs> totally random yeah. but like, i absolutely love it I'd love to talk about that and, and career change as well. And um, I also have started a, a leadership and lifestyle coaching business where I help companies with uh, potentially toxic work cultures around how to provide better health and well-being to their employees mm. through the leadership team being good role models, yeah. basically. Not yeah, just putting in a fitness program for the staff, but actually being knowledgeable and demonstrating that themselves yeah. so team building exercises i've got a podcast called lead lifestyle podcast um and do a bit of public speaking with that so that's kind of the culmination of my coaching knowledge and everything mm-hmm. i've had has gone into the leadership stuff and they're just drive lorries because because <laughs> i enjoy it pays the bills and yeah so, so that's good, me good totally random <laughs> i can kind of cover various things there so whatever you think would be helpful for people to learn you know let's talk about it yeah no i appreciate it um so before before we get into that because i'm already thinking of questions to ask but let's get let's get the uh uh bugatti very one which keep hinting to everyone that someone's got to bring me one day okay as a, as a present <laughs> i'll keep saying that until someone does um but no we start this uh podcast with a a gift for the show rather than for me um but it's something that um, I brought in so that we remember every single person individually and there's a wall behind you that hasn't got much on it yet and that's, that is the magic wall. Um, so yeah, I'm actually looking forward to yours because you think about things a lot rather than just shoot from the hip. So not to He's give saying you, they shot from the hip with those gifts. Too much. <laughs> no, actually. They, do you know what? It, well, it's like the condom one. Everyone's like, why is there a condom on the wall? I'm like, there's actually a really good story behind it. So you've got to watch the podcast to know what it is. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, um, I will hand over. Let me take over. over. I will hand over to you. So, uh, I obviously wanted to get into strongman because I was kind of bored of training for no goal, really. So got into strongman, asked you to, to give me a hand and we took it way too far (laughs) as usual, uh, you know, with setting big goals and everything. So did your novice comp, um, 2021 in May. 
Yeah, you'll know dates better than me, yeah. Yeah. And then um, had to do a drastic weight cut to get yeah, down it was to, to the under 80s. And I'm usually about 88 to 90 kilos, so that, that was miserable. Um, because I didn't do it smartly <laughs> with nutrition. Yeah. I just did it with dehydration at the end. Yeah. And then a few months later, did the Britain's Strongest Man Open at under under 80 kilos. Yeah. Open as in you could kind of just enter, couldn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and so what I've brought is not a material gift, but some lines of poetry, which I would recite to myself as a pre-lift ritual. Nice. You know, you've got to be prepared for your kneecaps to get blown off on rap squats, or maybe you're going to tear something on like heavy stones or log press. So to kind of get into the that warrior kind of frame of mind, I would always recite a couple of lines of, of Invictus. Yeah. Um, so I have it here. Are these the actual, I will perform are these your it actual lines? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, got you. This is the first stanza of the poem. So there's, it's a longer poem. So this is from Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Yeah. Quoted. Who had a difficult life himself. I think he yeah. had uh, serious illnesses, some injuries, mm. potentially lost a leg, but we need to fact check that. And just lying in hospital one day, determined to, no matter what happened in his life, overcome it mm. and just have a strong you know, lion mind, a strong yeah, mindset, yeah. A, a strong soul to get through it all. Yeah. So this poem is about no matter what happens in life and who you are and how things change, it's how strong you, you are mentally to get yeah. through it all. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so, Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Love it. Then I would do my lift. Yeah. And smash it. So, did you actually say this to yourself, like as a, as a, every like heavy a, out set, loud or every heavy set for eighteen months? Really? That's what that was my <laughs> love pre-game that. That ritual really from your lunatic programs that I had to do. So I took you some to some deep, deep, <laughs> deep, 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 deep so areas dark. I had to delve into literature <laughs> to get me through. I remember a couple of times, obviously, like. When when I was uh, you know working with you for a bit, I remember like because obviously like our oh, friendship as well as anything else, I remember a few times when you like that fucking literally like nearly killed me. So I was like, right, let's go again. Yeah, <laughs> you made me go that little bit more because you were like, shit, you nearly killed me. Yeah, and I'm not a great athlete, but I'm sick in terms of my training, so I'll, yeah. I enjoy that sort of yeah. thing and seeing seeing where I can go. There's not many people that could, that would say that as well. <laughs> and, and with pregame ritual stuff, it becomes. A habit and it, yeah. it can start triggering that right know, emotion if and, you were successful last time your brain starts thinking or oh, will be successful this time and it starts yeah. becoming a winning ritual yeah so that was my winning ritual yeah no, it's I my winning ritual. i still do it for heavy sets do you know that off the top of your head yeah you do yeah can i test you on it if you want <laughs> <laughs> out of the night that covers me dark as the pit from pole to pole i thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul, black as the pit. Black. I, I oh, you mistake. corrected yourself, though. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Under Sorry. pressure. I had to put you on the spot then. <laughs> but no, mate, I appreciate it. I love it, and I love the the thought behind it. I knew I knew you'd have a lot of thought behind yours. Um, I'm also cheap, so I wrote that out on a postcard. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were a bit framed or something. <laughs> but no, I appreciate it, man. Um, Thank you. Sorry, I let you down with not winning anything. <laughs> Mate, you won. You won. You won because you. you I did triple bodyweight you know, deadlift, and I feel like I've lost. <laughs> what What was that for you? What was that for you then? I did uh, two fifty five. Yeah, that was your comp, wasn't it? When yeah, you, yeah. yeah, that was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. But as well, you you was really fun to train because you sounds like I'm sucking up now. But you do you know, what you're told. Do you know what I mean? But that's one of those things, isn't it, in coaching that when you get people that l genuinely absorb it, listen and, and adapt and, you know, do as they're told, then y when we hit challenges, we're able to overcome them together. Do, do you know what I'm trying to say? Whereas when you get somebody that's, you know, without going off on a tangent here, but when you get somebody that's actually falsing the system, when a problem happens, you actually don't know how to handle it. I think as well you learn as a coach what annoying traits clients can have and you try yeah. to not have them and yeah. also you realise that you know say, let's say I have a 
hypothetical client who keeps asking questions or where's this program going where you know it could be 18 month plan i've got yeah, and yeah. I, I haven't written the 18 month plan we've just got goals for 18 months indicators yeah. you have to hit along the, the way that then will fall into place which yeah. will fall into place so yeah. you can't say i know where it's going yeah. but it's going to be dependent on your performance yeah. so i never would ask questions either even if i thought you're stupid and i know more than you <laughs> i would still would just do it that's what we thought all the way through so thank, thanks and, and i give the gift with with uh, fond memories no i appreciate it man i'll never do strong man again <laughs> yeah that was the end of that <laughs> quick quick start quick finish right so let's dig into a few things then um and like I, you know like i said earlier on I, I mean it when i say it i i've got you on the show because i i find your your story really interesting I also, and I'll throw this one out there, I and I've told you this hundred times anyway, most of the time when we're drunk, you yeah. are you are one of the calmest people for me to hang around with and, and feel... F- I, I'm very good at m- mimicking my surroundings. That's a good thing and a bad thing at different times, obviously. Okay. But you, because you're calm presence, when I'm with you, I feel calm. Right. Do you know what I mean? We've I, still nearly got into a few fights, though. Uh, well, but you know, it's like with other people. I mean, yeah, but it's one of the things where like there's always a there's always a spin-off. Um, but no, let, let's say let's tell people how we met first of all because it was a little bit reminiscent for us as well. But okay. Then, yeah. We, so we met. Um, did we meet at the mastermind? Can I talk on this podcast go. or what? Yeah. Bloody go. <laughs> what makes you think I am calm? What 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 makes makes you think I'm not? Stressed underneath it, or it's your presence, it's your external body language, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, facing we'll come back to it. Yeah, so uh, I was running the gym 2010 to 2014, then I went full time, and then I went full time because I hired a business coach who helped me. Yeah, and on his courses and events and masterminds, I met you, mm. which I think was it must have been 2014 or 2015. And you know, there was about 20 of us on the course, and you go through shared experiences don't you you know yeah. do how to do sales how to increase your prices how to get your business profitable and stay profitable so that you can survive mm. you know and and have a an income from something that you love but also how to set goals and and scale that mm. so i think you're obviously going to meet people who are like-minded within mm. that, that structure anyway aren't you because it's you're not going to meet people who don't own gyms or no, don't course. have businesses yeah, 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 yeah. um but yeah i think i think we click because probably both enjoy aggressive training yeah um i've got i'm from like a military family but not been in the military myself and but you've been in the military so i yeah. think i appreciated how you spoke yeah. just straight to the point um which is how i kind of tried to speak <laughs> probably a bit more polite than you um and then business is probably in the in a similar position i would have thought both in kind of fairly small towns yeah similar size gym and layout and wanted to train the same type of people whereas there were people on the course who were running boxing big, boot big. camps and other things oh, right, yeah, but there was we're more about well, strength and yeah and basic training mm. but hard you know basic yeah. strength and conditioning so that's where we first met i think you know as well it's funny when you say that because i'm trying to think of the actually where we was at stage wise when we met you I'm not I'm not very good at going back to you know like pinpointing memories and stuff but I remember when we first met you had your gym and I looked up to your gym and was like shit that is what I want everyone did on that course yeah. but I always would never be making a profit and always be yeah. like why is everyone looking up to me doing this yeah but it, isn't that crazy though and yeah. obviously it's it's, a, it, it's not wrong anyway because people do want that and they, I think they did, to was I that. portraying a uh, more yeah. successive image, a more successful image than yeah. I actually had. But that says a lot, doesn't it? Or was everyone else, de- you know, delusional? <laughs> yeah. But either way, that's what that's what it's about, right? It was kind of but being that's... in a room full of wild egos. Yeah, looking yeah. back yeah. on it, yeah. in a good way. Yeah. You know, you can channel that. Possibly, but that's, but that's a little like having a Ferrari and then living at home with the mum. Do, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, like. You see you out in the streets like fucking hell, Alan's got a Ferrari. Like you must be doing well. But then you go home and you live home with your mum. And do you know what I'm saying? Like you, yeah, it, 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 that that that's that sort of thing, isn't it? Where Who are you pe- working all for? people yeah. really were looking at is your Ferrari. Yeah. And actually, the Ferrari was your gym because that's what. Man, I mean, size wise, your gym was fucking huge, wasn't it? Like, yeah. I'm trying to think back now because there was, there was there's been three, hasn't there now? Or has there been more? It's been about seven. Right for me, there's been three or maybe more. Then I might I might yeah. be missing the yeah. 
Yeah. So but, was, that was four thousand square foot. The one that, that you would have seen. Yeah. Yeah. Too yeah. big for what I needed. Yeah, it for. was because that was the problem, wasn't it? You weren't quite filling it, were you, for what it, what it for what it cost? Yeah. But again, that's that thing, isn't it? Where would well, you think you made a mistake by going too big, though? Looking back. I like reading Joseph Campbell's work on the hero's journey. I know you don't like reading books nope. too much, but essentially everyone's life tends to go through several stages mm. and films and, and novels tend to follow the same pattern. Basically you have a protagonist, which is me or you yeah. in your story. Um, you live in your comfortable life at home, blah, blah, blah. And then you get a call to adventure and then you go out on that adventure and you go through your own trials and tribulations mm. and you meet guides and friends and things along the way. And I think that it was, in hindsight, it was a mistake, but I think it was a trial that I needed to go through to get to, to, to the next stage. The next, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the end of the hero's journey is you, you reach your gift or you realize what you can add to the community mm. or to the wider world. Then you go back home where you started from, yeah, but you brought rebuild. that gift with you. Yeah, it's good. So I think you have to go through those stages. But yeah, it was total ego. I I often think, oh, if I stayed in the smaller gym and added in good marketing and good branding and advertising and sales skills and retention and increased the prices, then it would have been immensely profitable, but smaller. Yeah. It would have been like, no one would have known I was cashing four grand a month after tax profit mm. and after my own salary. You know, and I would... Yeah. T 10 years ago basically I would be loaded by now Yeah. but I went you know what let's push it to 11, 12 grand a month in expenses and then try and make a profit on top of that yeah. and I had months where I did but not very many weren't you at like 20k income at one point or even 26 why have I got 26 in my head we were between 15 and 20 thousand a month revenue Yeah. but it was about 11 break even point 11 thousand break even yeah. so when I got months that were 20 grand um, in revenue, I would have spent more on advertising, which yeah. is thousands. So yeah. it was only like probably between zero, probably between three thousand profit and minus two thousand loss. That yeah. I say that's roughly where it ran for six years. But in six years, it made over half a million in revenue. Yeah. And six years ago, I would have been like, or ten years ago, I would have been like, oh, you know, I've made half a million, blah blah blah. You know, I'm so good. Yeah. Now I make more than that driving a lorry yeah do you know what i mean yeah every month and there's no stress mm. and so um how does that make you feel because i'll be honest with you and obviously i can be honest because you're a very good friend when you first said to me you were going into a doing your hgv license right i had this weird feeling where i automatically i think i do this a lot anyway right but i automatically put myself in your shoes and i felt sick do you know what I'm trying to say? I no. felt like... Why did you feel Well, I felt like... I felt like it was like, wow, that's not where you started and that took a turn that I didn't think it was going to. Like I was having to do it. Yeah. yeah, do you, yeah. But do you know what? And I'm saying this out of confidence that I know you won't take it the wrong way because I know you was doing the right thing for you, your situation, and for you as a person. Do yeah. you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. What I was doing then, I'll admit it, it was, it was my ego. Because I was pretending it was me for a... I didn't mean to. It was that subconscious feeling of like, do yeah. you know what I'm saying? Because we've been through the same journey. Yeah. What else? I think what I'm trying to say it's is almost like I cashed out and was like, I'm yeah. See, see but, you but later. Then, then all of a sudden I felt like, whoa, what if that was me? What would it make me feel like? And then I felt sick. I felt like, fuck, I've literally failed my life. Yeah. Why? But exactly, that's the thing though. But but actually, the step that you're taking is well to where it's, you are it's now. It's other people's it's, opinions of you, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it was a huge weight on my shoulders because I was doing one of the government boot camp things where it's like yeah. free training but it took about six months to do all the health and safety courses and how the transport industry works and everything mm. which you don't need to do to have HGV license but these training centers have to show they've taught you those things yeah. to get funding off the government yeah of course so, so yes yeah, so you're ticking boxes so really it was really drawn anyway. out right yeah. and, and I didn't want to tell the clients in the gym that I was training I remember that stage so yeah. I had about six months where I was like oh what's everyone going to say when yeah. I you know oh by the way I've quit I'm not going to ever work at a gym again and I'm going to go and drive lorries. Mm. Um, but you know what? Every single client was so supportive when I, yeah. when I said it. I did a video in the group and I said, 
you know, it's been difficult, I want to move my life forwards. And essentially with business, it feels like you have success for a couple of years and then there'll be um, an inevitable kind of uh, hurdle that you have to overcome. Mm -hmm. So it might be staff leaving and stealing clients which we can go into. It might be an unexpected tax bill. It might be your landlord says, oh, you've got to move out or the rent's going to double. Um, And so in that sense, it was COVID. And I just thought, you know, this is probably my 10th massive hurdle. Mm. And all that's happened is the gym's building up to a point, which is positive, and I'll talk about it. And then it's falling back down, and I'm having to climb that mountain again and again and again. And I realized that's just the nature of having a service-based fitness business with a load of clients mm. in my experience there'll be people like you know Hormozy or whoever who've, who've successfully had systems and they can have hundreds of thousands of clients and and it mm. is quite stable but mine just never was and the positive side of it is i was always involved with providing good strength and conditioning programming and i've got a sports science degree and i've coached you know, at elite levels. Mm. So I knew that everyone coming in the gym was going to get good programming. Yeah. So it was always a really high standard. And I always thought it's kind of like I was trying to run like Gordon Ramsay level high quality training gym mm. and expecting to be able to scale it like a McDonald's. But yeah. you can't do those two no. things. And so I thought. Um, but that come a lot from the mastermind stuff, didn't it? The scaling. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that pressure of you have to scale, you have to scale. Yeah, well, but actually, it's but not. That is, it works sometimes. That is the journey if you want to make yeah. more money. You've got to yeah. scale it. Yeah. So yeah, positives were the culture in the gym is really positive. Everyone, I knew every single client. Um, you know, over the entire eleven years that I was working and leading it, I've coached almost everyone there. Mm. So it's not like I had a time where I didn't know everyone there, and I've still got really good clients who've been there for ten years who Sarah trains now. Yeah. So it's been a good journey. And then what I found with the HGV stuff, just to kind of finish off on that point, almost all the, the clients in the gym that I used to train were asking me, how much is it to do it? How much do you earn? And they yeah. were realizing that they weren't happy in their careers. And all you've got to do is have the courage to make a career change. Yeah. And because Sarah took over the gym, I was really fortunate that she wanted to do that. So the gym still exists. I still see everyone that I used to train. I still can go in and use my own gym to train in. Yeah. I don't work there anymore. Staff now work there. So they've got a career out of it. You know, yeah. you know, there's full-time salary there for someone else who stepped in and did it. And I absolutely love driving lorries and talking about it. So yeah. it's, it was, I was but amazed. Does it feel like it's still there for you? Still where? Do you feel like you still got the gym? Uh, no, I think it's it's a total powerlifters paradise now. Yeah. I'm not a powerlifter, so I don't want to be a part of it. Don't want to be a powerlifter. <laughs> <laughs> don't get it. <laughs> but I'll support it. And, if you and were help. A power, if you went full powerlifting, would you go sumo or conventional? Sumo, just because you have to be competitive. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> conventional, if I didn't want to tear anything. <laughs> um, conventional, if you want to be impressive. Well, we're trying to have some coherence. <laughs> what I was saying, so. Um, so yeah that's kind of the journey through scaling the gym struggling with it and and I'd like to stress that I didn't give up I was probably one of the most mentally tough people that I know and I will mm. you know back myself on that and you know I've managed to take the positive lessons of that into the leadership business so it's almost evolved for me into I've got stability with my finances now mm. and no stress from my job and I do four days on four days off so in the four days off you only work in half time, aren't you? Yeah. So you can do yeah. a part time business or podcast or with it or whatever within that. Yeah. Which is very scary, yeah, to, to to decide to do that. Plus it's given you so much more space for growth, hasn't it? Like mentally and And it's a stepping stone. And physically. You know, it's yeah. not like I'm gonna be a lorry driver forever. Yeah. It's just part of um getting my personal and finances and family life and everything back on track because you give everything to a business don't you and yeah. if there's no money at the end of the month you still have to pay your staff and the bills and everything mm. and then you're eating you know <laughs> gone off bread and <laughs> rice for a week <laughs> i just want to stop the podcast for a second here just to mention silverback gymwear these guys are sponsoring the podcast and I want you to know how good their quality of clothing is. And they've just launched at the moment the new women's brand. So jump onto their website, have a look for your, could be a wife, could be a daughter, could be a mother, whoever you want to buy it for, 
or it could be you if you're a female watching this and listening. But please go and check them out. Their quality is really, really good. And they've got so many different colors and different designs to choose from. Yeah, so, but something I do generally want to say, just quick before we move on, is that I, I massively respect your journey that you've took. You know, from when I first met you, you know, I looked up to you massively with the gym sort of side of things, and you helped me a hell of a lot. I don't know if you knew that anyway, but, you know, you, yeah, you was, you, your gym was like the direction I was trying to take my gym, and, you know, and obviously I know we've helped each other along, along, along the journey, but I just used to look up to that a lot. I got my gym in that place. And then knowing that you've gone through this transition and changed to where you are now, yeah, I, I respect it massively because you've took, you know, it's, it, I'm not talking for you, but I know that it's took you a lot to decide to do all that shift, hasn't it? Um, and I think a lot of people haven't got the mental resilience to continue a positive path. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like yeah. many people would have, I don't know, like, ended the gym career do you know what i mean ended that like complete like you've you've chose to keep it as it is and shift things and then you continue your journey in a different way yeah um but obviously to now get your first house last week was it a couple weeks yeah, ago yeah do you mean like and, and obviously we spoke all the way through that as well didn't we so it's nice to now see you've just done a complete like you know it feels weird and I, I mean thanks thanks for for saying all that no, yeah, no i mean nice it, like, to hear. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it feels like probably the first time in my life where i've gone if I do this now, in two years' time, yeah. something positive could happen. You're actually thinking strategically. But that's actually happened now. That's actually yeah. happened, yeah. And, and I remember when we was, oh, I was sitting on my sofa, I, I remember, because you weren't sitting there when well, I was on the phone to you. <laughs> um, I was visioning moments, though, you know, like that way. Like, I can remember sitting there talking. When we were, when we were, we'd had a, I don't know, we was on the phone for about an hour or something, we was chatting about all that sort of stuff. And you're on about, yes, yeah, so my plan is to do this, 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 and this. And now to look back and see you've done it, like, I just, yeah, I love shit like that, because I think I envy that, because I'm not very uh, <laughs> planned like that. Yeah, yeah. But but I know what you mean. A lot of people would just be quietly miserable yeah. and, and carry on. I agree. And it did get to a point where I was depressed, and I didn't enjoy coaching. I, I did enjoy coaching, but I didn't enjoy every other job role that you have to do as a business owner. Yes. Eventually. It was fun yeah. at the start. And I've had, I would say, hundreds of clients, if not, 90% of all of my clients they'll come into the gym tired at least once mm. and I'll ask you know are you okay have you had a stressful day and it's always to do with work yeah. or most of the time it's to do with work yeah oh what do you do oh, blah 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 you know no oh, I hate it I, yeah yeah and I always say well, why don't you get a different job yeah. and it's almost like people have um I'm I'm generalizing here but it's almost like they've got so much uh expenses on the mortgage and the car payment and and not that you can give, not that you can give kids back but having kids and everything else you know uh, what i mean um or or trying to keep up with other people in terms of clothes and holidays and things yeah. like that it's such a material way of living your life yeah you probably can't change job because what can you go in at an entry level that will have as high a salary as you're on now mm. which was a, a, a good thing about lorry driving was it was more than i could make as a yes as a pt yeah because you did them figures before didn't you I remember yeah. when you first but so my yeah. first year driving i made forty five thousand pounds in a year yeah but, um before tax yeah so it's like i can't b believe it yeah. was that much money but traditionally and in my head and i know a lot of people's stereotypical view of a trucker is just like you know fat Big lazy fat. person yeah, yeah. but it's such a professional highly regulated industry yeah and everyone's really helpful in, in a way that you don't get in fitness like we were obviously in a, a mastermind and a friendship where we would share ideas because i know mm. that you're not going to steal clients from me because you're in Loughborough and i'm in yeah. warrington yeah but there aren't many people who will share the secrets of programming or business in the fitness industry yeah. but in driving every you can't shut them up Oh yeah, and you know that delivery point in Leeds when you have to go reverse off the main road. How do you do it? How about oh no, don't do it that way. Do it this way, and they're actually helpful. Yeah. You know, oh don't turn left at that traffic lights. Go around the block and go right. Loop. Do you turn at this roundabout? And you can come in on your good side instead of your blind side. Yeah. And so I'll I'll even go up to people I don't know and ask them questions, and they're always really supportive. Yeah. Or like just in like motorway services, just nod of like respect to each other. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's the trucker community. And, um, it's a bit like the biker, like the that <laughs> yeah. little, little nod. It's like okay. So that uh, that was a breath of fresh air compared to the fitness industry. Yeah. But what I was saying about clients not enjoying their jobs, I thought 
I'd always say to Mark, quit your job then, you know, get another job. Mm. But I didn't ever think it would happen to me where yeah. I wouldn't enjoy what I was doing. And so um, for me, it started the in a strange way with the Manchester Arena bombing in 2017. Yeah. So it was in May, so yeah. almost exactly six years ago. And That's crazy, it's that long ago. Like, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it was. Yeah, so I was at home and Sarah said, oh, there's been an explosion at, at you know, yeah. MEN Arena, we call it. Yeah. Uh, which is like four miles from, from my house where I used to live. And I've worked there and I've been there loads. And you walk past it all the time when you're in town. Mm. And, you know, I didn't think it was a terrorist thing. I just went to bed, woke up the next day, and it was like 22 people have been killed and mm. hundreds more injured. And then me and Sarah went on holiday the day after that. And the entire holiday, I just was like, I just had a weird feeling. Like, oh, I'm depressed. Like, what's mm. what's going on here? Like, I just don't get it. And then I said to Sarah, I think I'm really upset about the the arena bombing. Like I don't I don't get why <laughs> a, a current event has never affected me in this way, but now it is. Mm. And uh, didn't really think much more of it. And then a couple of months later, um, I saw an advert for joining the army, for the army reserves on Facebook, and I mm. went on there and I was looking at every role. And then it turned into like an obsession every day. Yeah. I'd look at every single army reserve role you could do and then i realized like oh i want to it's it's been almost like my 9-11 trigger where you hear like there yeah, were yeah. people queuing outside because yeah, then they want to help help and yeah there were queues down the streets to join yeah. the military and stuff and i was like i thought about it and i spoke to some of my friends who have had been in the military or, or are still in and and they're like hey you just you know you just want to serve that's what it is and i think that someone it took someone coming to my town mm. and Kill, killing a loads of kids for me yeah. to go you know what not everyone has the physical fitness co cognitive ability the teamwork elements to go into a, a military team like that mm. so not everyone can do it or should do it but because i can i feel like i have like a it was like a drive to go and actually help or serve yeah or, uh, I, ne I never knew that was the story behind it yeah so but that took probably two years for me to have the courage to admit to myself that that's what I want to do and in a roundabout way I never wanted to join the military because my dad was in yeah. and I had a difficult childhood with him you know we get on really well now but it took some tough conversations you know in my 20s to kind of unpack all that stuff yeah. and I remember being like 13 years old I'm never going to join the army be anything like you because you've seen that because yeah. I associated his negative traits Through aggressiveness uh, you know, emotionally distant through, but through from being in the army, yeah. Mm. Um, and then I decided to do the hardest possible <laughs> military reserves course, which is the Royal Marines mm. uh, Commando Reserve course, and went to the the depot in Manchester. And they were like the soundest guys, like totally, you know, muscles bulging out of the the shirts, and they were like really helpful. And then they were like, oh, "Here's how you do it." So they helped me kind of go and do the tests and do the interview and everything and then I did the uh, the PRMC course potential Royal Marines course they mm. did like an extra one in a, in Swinnerton camp I don't know mm. if you ever went there no it just was like miserable but I loved it it was just getting beasted basically for like two and a half days and then it was an 18 month course where you'd go and exercise every other week mm. um, and drill nights once or twice every week and I just naively thought you could do that whilst running the gym. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? And it it's they sell it like that because that's what you people can do it. Yeah, I think but, if you have a nine to five job, yeah, it's and, guaranteed and, and total, to be that. It's still yeah. really hard. Like total yeah. respect to anyone who does any level of. It's a lot. Service. It's a lot to put in outside of your normal life. Yeah, yeah. And I did I did four months of it, and on exercise, you know, I had about an hour's sleep. Probably not the best time to make that sort of decision. Mm. I just voluntary with withdrew on the day and said, you know, I feel like. You know, my mental health is like couldn't be lower. Yeah. I was working at the gym at four a.m. yesterday morning. I haven't slept until, you know, now, yeah. and I'm on a bloody military exercise. Yeah, and it just it was just sleep deprivation, not good. Yeah, it was just silly. And then you know, they obviously waited a few days, and then spoke to me properly, and I said, no, I still think you know, there's there's no way I can do it without quitting the gym and and losing that. Shifting so it's either life. lose yeah. lose my goal of of being in the military reserves. Or lose my business that I've been running for nine years. It's been a long time. Yeah. At, at that point, so I thought, right, you know, 
I'll come out and maybe reconsider and in a year go back in or whatever. I didn't know what I was going to do. Mm. Uh, so that was November 2019 when I, when I left that. And so I didn't do anything in the, in the military. I just had attempted the training, let's say. I would never say that I've been in the military, but, but had a good taste for it. And weirdly, it was really nostalgic. It was like, oh, this is why my dad says, stand by, go. You know, when, when yeah. I was a kid, it wasn't like, one, two, three, yeah. start 100 meter race. He'd be like, stand by, go. Uh, <laughs> so it was like really nostalgic and, and helped me kind of weirdly bond with, with my dad afterwards, even though he makes fun of me for being the, <laughs> having the shortest service record in the Marines ever. <laughs> but Christmas 2019, I was driving back to Wales to see my family with Sarah and, and she just said, oh, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll try the parachute regiment reserves. Well, but she just was like, you're not, you should miserable. Like, you're not happy. Like what, what are you not happy about? Mm. And I burst into tears. And I was just like, well, I feel like really alone. I don't feel like any of my family know what I'm going through. I don't really know what I'm going through. I've run the gym for nearly 10 years mm. and I don't really feel like my personal life has benefited at all. Mm. I don't have any money saved up or anything because any time there was an issue with the gym or a new bit of kit or whatever I just would pay for it yeah. regardless of your wage as well wasn't it yeah I just would like put my life and soul in, into the gym for 10 years and there are loads of positives from that like all the people I've helped you know get into Super League academies which is like the, the goal of starting the gym all the people you help lose 3-4 stone in, in body weight and keep those healthy habits you know mm. there is one in a hundred that actually listens to you isn't there and yeah, yeah, yeah. keep it going yeah. so there's obviously loads of intangible successes mm. but ultimately you, you need some money to to live your life don't you yeah i said i don't feel like i got any money and i really burnt out and I'm just i just feel like i hate coaching i just get up in the morning i'm like feel sick i've got to go in and run my own business mm. and then which is not a nice thing to feel for your yeah. that's that that's self-employment yeah you know and that's the thing isn't it that People sell this dream to people and, oh, run your own business, choose your own hours, this, that, and the other. It's great to hear both sides, isn't it, for that, for the people who, who are actually setting their business up now thinking that it's going to be an easy yeah. ride. Yeah. So we were parked up at a motorway services and I'm crying in the car <laughs> Christmas Eve and and Sarah wouldn't let me leave the car park until I said, you know, I don't want to do the gym anymore. So she was a big part of me saying, you know, mm. making the the conscious and verbal decision to say yeah I'm out like and we can we then made a plan like, over the next few years you know when the lease ends we'll close it mm. so that was Christmas 2019 three months and that was the bigger gym yeah that was the bigger gym yeah three months later then Covid happened all yeah. gyms were locked down and the government gave that grant and so I was like wow could be out of debt could close the gym yeah and you know do any other career you know just build something else up and, and figure out what I want to do and I spoke to I had a business mentor he still helps me Oliver he's massive help and I spoke to a few guys at the gym who had businesses and just said you know here's my options what would you do here's how I feel about working in the business what would you do and it was basically a close it and be debt free you know instead of having to liquidate and pay your creditors yeah I could have been debt free or Sarah said we could we could downsize it and have like a tiny gym like when I first started go back to hardcore training mm. get rid of the boot camps get rid of the, the personal training get rid of morning classes so you can actually yeah. have a lie in get yeah. rid of weekend classes I remember classes. that transition because that was huge for you wasn't yeah. it and we didn't do Friday so she said what yeah. if you just helped other coaches do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday Thursday evenings Saturday mornings mm. and the rest of the time it's an open gym people can just come and go and use the gym as they please Mm. and it'll be a powerlifting gym and I'll run it and you don't have, have to any anything to do with it so basically for me the gym was closed mm. but for everyone who's in it, it could carry on in some form and I was like yeah you know let's let's do that because Sarah was also thinking what what because we were running it together from 2015 onwards mm. so she was obviously thinking <laughs> if I <laughs> wants to close the gym what am I going to do kind of thing which you know, I'd never thought of because a bit selfish, but you kind of have to be when you're in those survival yeah, moments yeah. in your life. And um, so, yeah, that's what we did after COVID or during COVID. It was like 18 months really for gyms, wasn't it, COVID? Mm. So from March till September, we were closed, renegotiated to get out of the lease that we were in, in that, that 4,000 square foot unit, moved around the corner to where my gym was six years prior yeah. to, to like a smaller unit. 
and so that was 2,000 square foot, so half the size, got rid of the boot camps, got rid of the mornings, and just sent a video to the clients, like, kind of got to do this because money and people have left and we can't afford to run the bigger gym, mm. but also we want to go back to old school powerlifting and bodybuilding and hardcore training and not have to do boot camps and PT and anymore. Mm. So a few people were upset, but understood, you know, I wish you'd carry on doing boot camps and they left, fine in brackets great <laughs> you know don't yeah. have to deal with it anymore um and then i helped for the next year so from september 2020 to september 2021 i just did like the odd day while sarah was getting together you know with staff to do the rest of the sessions and then i just had loads of time to think about what i want to do next mm. because we didn't have to do loads of sales or you know loads of advertising to to grow the gym because the expenses were so low it was kind of easy to to run it yeah so a really positive thing you is were basically making a job roll up for yourself then wasn't it? yeah i was just hanging about yeah and i had time to think so that's when i started doing leadership talks and stuff on lifestyle and things for people that i knew who had mm. who were like executives did a few talks on zoom because it was still like you couldn't go in in person yeah ran that team building event um and then i started my own podcast which is the Leader Lifestyle Podcast, mm. and tried to do just really good conversations about what I'd been through, really. Like, if you're struggling, if if that was me in charge of a 1,000 employees, that would have been a crap culture. Because yeah. for a couple of years, so 2017, 2019, I would have been horrible to be around. I wouldn't have actually wanted to be in that yeah, job role. It all would have fed off, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I just was really conscious of that. Started researching it, and it's basically a lot of research now is showing that toxic cultures come from the top down it mm. isn't the people it's how they're led and so any sort of health well-being mental health financial social well-being um program if you like has got to come from the leaders actually doing it and bringing their their people with them yeah you know what that that actually reminds me as well you know that whole mentality of a a good manager you know the manager that mucks in with you? Do you know what I mean? That's that sort of feel, isn't it? It's like, yeah. you're not just telling me what to do and you're not telling me it's gone wrong. You're actually showing me how to We're do doing it and it we together. do it together. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what that, yeah. And, A lot. And, um, and then I started doing that and then I was finding myself going down the same patterns of, am I enjoying this? Like, I don't want to do coaching. So how mm. am I going to do lifestyle coaching for leaders when I don't actually enjoy coaching anymore? And then I spoke to a careers counsellor and he said, oh, you, you're just totally burnt out. Like, you just got burnt out and you're retired. He said, think of it as if you're a pro footballer from 19 to 34. Mm. And then you get injured and you have to retire at 34. What are you going to do next? It's, it's, a, it's a new chapter. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. We're going to play five-a-side football. Yeah, you don't want to do football. That's my yeah, point. But basically, yeah. I was thinking of the five-a-side football version of my career. Yeah. Instead of going, you know what? I could do something totally different. And then... Um, I decided to become a helicopter pilot. <laughs> yeah, I remember when you <laughs> and, uh, and I went and did pilot selection um, and past pilot selection to get into a school, but it was like 80 grand just to do the commercial course. And then, you know, then you'd be working up to becoming a captain. So mm. I thought, right, how can I afford to do that? And that's what originally got me into lorry driving. I thought, I'll, I'll drive lorries and I'll do online coaching and I'll just make, I'll just make 80 grand. It was mm. a total like fight fire with fire approach. Um, and I was just totally lost and just, I was trying so many things. So in, in just four years, I tried mm. join the Marines, uh, quit the gym, pulled back into the gym, online coaching, leadership and lifestyle coaching and running events and doing podcasting. And I was just like lost, totally mm. lost. Sounds like my week. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know where you are. No. But I knew I was, I, at least I was open to trying a lot of things yeah. to see where it could take me. And then Sarah said last Christmas, oh, have you thought about joining the fire service? And then I thought, hey, that could be like like the military, like the service. Yeah, same sort of environment and people. Yeah, and that same drive from what happened in Manchester six years ago, that triggered me thinking I could do something for the wider community and to develop myself and be part of a team. Um, mm. That's my goal now is is to become a firefighter and and then just give myself space and time to see you know if if I start a business again or if I go back into the gym or if I do more online coaching, it can happen. 
Yeah. But we get into these mindsets where everything has to happen all at once. Mm. So I passed my HGB license at the end of 2021. So it's been coming up on two years of driving. And I just thought... That's I mean, bars, wasn't it? Yeah. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to drive a lorry and get paid. Yeah. And I'm not going to start a business. And so I haven't done any podcasting since then. But I've kept it alive. Yeah. You know, I've kept paying for the hosting because I thought... It's an option. I might hate yeah, lorry yeah. driving and go back to but it. You can also do that at any point, can't you? As soon as you're settled. Yeah. And so I've thought what lorry driving has represented is taking the pressure off having to make a career decision. Yeah. So it's a conscious decision to, to choose a stepping stone type thing. Mm. So if anyone's listening, they're in like, they hate their job. Where you could learn from my mistakes is go all in on deciding to change career don't mm. try and add something else in at the same time because you're going to really struggle yeah and also um choose something that's a stepping stone so don't quit your job and then look for a new job do something that will get you a similar amount of money maybe mm. a bit less maybe you can't lease that fancy car uh, but but you'll be happier yeah. you know working in a library four mm. days a week or being a remote personal assistant for someone mm. you know on the internet versus another three years down the line even worse position worse place yeah put weight on yeah <laughs> you know hate your life in three years you could have your dream job and be happy yeah in six years you could be making more than you're making now in yeah. your dream job yeah it just doesn't happen immediately no and but so so many people have that mindset though, don't yeah they? i did i was looking for immediate changes to my life and, it, and if it's not immediate it's not you don't do it yeah it's just it's crazy when you say it out loud though isn't it yeah yeah hmm I think that, like, you know, you know, going through that stage, do you feel like, well, d did you always know you was going to take that path of success regardless? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Because, because did you ever feel that you was, you was actually on your knees and thought, fuck, I don't know what to do here? What do you mean? Because I, I always feel like you or you never, you always have that determination and that I will make it better regardless, don't you? You always have that mentality. But did you at ever one point think, fuck, I actually don't know what to do here? A few times I thought about going back to Wales, you know, live yeah. with live with my mum and just, I don't know. Just restarting just, in a way, take the pressure off yourself. Yeah, almost a regression to being a kid again and then figuring it out. Yeah. Um, and no, I suppose I never, ever think I'm not going to make it. Yeah. That is the definition of losing hope, isn't it, when you're suicidal? Yeah. Um, I have had a moment where I walked over a bridge and I was like, not even thinking about it, but I felt the pull to like jump off the bridge. Really? And then I was like, it was scary. I was like, well, I'm not going to do it, but I've never had but that never feeling before. About it. So obviously something's making me really miserable. Yeah. And I thought, I don't care about a client complaining or the tax man needs more money. Like I've got to change something. I can't. Mm. I can't do this anymore. So no, I've never. I never thought. It's an untenable, unwinnable position that I'm in. Mm. But you've got to be open to almost random events materialising in your life so that you can change career. It won't happen the way you, you will plan it. No. Nine times out of ten. No. So like if, if six years ago when I was working at the gym, just before feeling burnt out, you said, oh, you're going to be a lorry driver in four years. You'd literally laugh, wouldn't you? You'd be laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. When I was in primary school in Wales, oh, you're going to be a lorry driver in Rochdale when you're 30. <laughs> like, yeah, you're right, like, what? Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't believe it. No. But if that leads to me becoming a firefighter, you know, yeah. and being happy and potentially doing a job that benefits a lot of people, yeah, you know. But also... It, it, it's, lo it's, it's not looking at a snapshot of the journey. It's zooming out and going... Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah and, the whole and being open to it going in any direction. Yeah. And as well, that's your that's your... Lion mind mentality, isn't it? That's your I will fucking win yeah. in the Whatever end. Whatever happens, yeah, we're going I'm always gonna it. I'm always gonna keep going and I won't give up. Yeah. What do you think it takes for some people? This is a question that we will we'll probably both struggle to understand and explain, but what do you think it takes for some people to actually not have that? You know, like not have that mentality and and what goes through their head? Do you know what I'm saying? Like no. do 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 you know someone that has had Who that could much change pressure. It doesn't. Yeah, that has that much pressure, and they're like, "I'm just gonna fucking be unhappy." Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I know a lot of people like that. I'd say that is the norm. 
But what, what's different between you and me and them? Um, probably having little wins along the way, realising it can happen. Mm. Um, setting a goal that seems delusional and actually achieving it mm. once or twice. Maybe you fail 20 times, but you win once or twice. It's so it doesn't doesn't seem as big a deal then. Like I could probably tell you, you could do any job in the UK for a day, and you you'd have a go and do it. Yeah. Some people are terrified of the thought, and so I think you, you have, have to have beat a, out the comfort zone. Yeah, you gotta have a little, first, yeah. you gotta have little wins first. Yeah. Yeah, I just always find that interesting. It's such an undiscovered uh, explanation, isn't it? Because I always say that I literally have the power to continue regardless. I don't know what that is, but I have it. Do you know what I'm saying? No matter what gets thrown at me, it doesn't matter. Don't get me wrong, it's not that I won't cry sometimes or I won't feel shit or feel low and all these things, but I, I know regardless of what gets put in front of me, I just know I will attack it. And I don't know what that is, but I have. I feel like I have that power and I will continue to push forward. Drill down and find out what that is. <laughs> is it, yeah, I'd love to do it. So when we look at obviously like you know the, the the way that people's brains work and the, and the way people are very demotivated negative yeah because we deal with it all the time right and actually our industry is i'd probably say 80 percent about that rather than the fitness <laughs> which is crazy it's about overcoming that in people yeah yeah do, do you know what i'm saying and that and that's yeah. that's what we deal with the most right and you know we could both reflect back to it and look back to it but it's like all the boot camp stuff ultimately it was just the accountability it was just telling them they're doing good it was making sure that they're on track they might not be winning but by being there they're winning do you know what i mean it's not that you know for the for the years that we were doing the whole fat loss scene it's not about losing weight to win although that's what they say it is it's actually about turning up is winning do you know what I'm trying to say? So, so with all that sort of like mindset and that lifestyle and everything like that, what sort of what sort of strategies or things have you got or done that that blocks that out for you? Yeah. Well, I would just first totally agree. Like, if anyone is a PT or a coach out there, it is almost hundred percent psychological. And when you get mm. that client that just does what you say, it's a surprise. Yeah, it's and, like and oh my god, you listened. And it's amazing, isn't you it? You ate eighteen hundred calories feeling. every day for twenty eight days, and you've lost. You know, yeah. and shit, your results yeah. are the reason why. Um, and the people that don't, I always would just think when I first started coaching, oh, they're weak, they're not motivated, blah blah blah. But then you learn, no, it's actually like they got up at six a.m. because the baby was crying. They've gone to work. They hate mm. their job. The manager shouted, and they've been stuck in traffic for two hours. Got home. Uh, they've had to make tea because a partner was out or whatever mm. and they're knackered and then you know the dog was barking all night and they're sleep deprived and you're asking them at 5 30 in the morning oh what did you eat your healthy meals last night you know yeah, and they're thinking i'm gonna stab you in the face <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's totally understandable first of all like if if your pto coach that it's external factors um but in terms of like having a goal and achieving it I think you've got to create your own uh, delusional inner world. Mm. You've got to live in a land of imagination where it has already happened and you already are there and you're just waiting for the, the outside world to, to notice it, Fall it. Yeah, yeah. basically. So in my head when I started my gym, it was already a 4,000 square foot gym with AstroTurf, with sleds, ropes, mm. all the S&C equipment I could ever want my own office with a little window where I could look out and see everyone absolutely smashing the workouts. And I had that vision like lying in my bed in my, basically my student flat um, and you know reading loads of self-help books and just totally getting clear on what that vision was. But my first gym was basically a shed with an old bar that I'd used when I was a kid mm. and some plates and a sandbag that I made at B&Q, you know, gaffer tape and the sand. Yeah. And put it inside an old army duffel bag. Who did you look up to right at the start? Joe DeFranco. Yeah. And Zach Evanesh. Zach Evanesh, that was it. He's the one like, who, he always reminds me of you all the other way around. They're like my garage gym <laughs> yeah. idols. Yeah, I would like, I would write to them. I'd like watch all this stuff. Because in at that time in the UK, there was no strength and conditioning no, gyms. They they were the dogs, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. I've not looked nowadays. I bet they're still up there. Yeah, yeah, still going. So, um, I had a job in a shoe shop and I'd be stacking shoes in the stock room and I'd be telling the people, oh, you know, I'm going to, 
my gym opens tomorrow. And in my head, you know, massive strength and conditioning facility. Mm. But what I'd show them pictures of a shed with yeah. a gaffer taped up sandbag and, you know, dusty floor. And they'd be like, that's just a shed. And I'd be really upset. Yeah. And I'd be like, I was, I was just so delusional. But that's what you need. Yeah. yeah. And then, then suddenly, well, suddenly, you know, two, three years later, uh, it got a bit bigger. And I was in a thousand square foot actual industrial unit with a roller shutter. Yeah. Still couldn't afford the floor. And I had two bars yeah. and two power racks. And that was it. I could train like three or four people at once. And I still had a job. So I was working in a bank, nine till five. And I'd walk home, get in my car and drive to the gym and then run the gym six till nine every day. Mm. And in the morning, I'd get up and do blog posts and, you know, write emails to the email newsletter and try and yeah. promote the gym. And it took about two years of that to get 20 clients. Like it was slow going. And every time I get to work, they'd be so negative, like, oh, the traffic, oh, the weather or, you know, just normal people, people, yeah. that people yeah. moan about. I was convinced that if I let that be absorbed into my psyche I would fail at the gym mm. so I'd walk to work listening to Tony Robbins in my headphones I'd get to work and every 25 minutes I'd get up and have a protein shake or go to the toilet or whatever I'd, I'd do like little stints I was on the the cash desk yeah. you know in the bank be, yeah. behind the screen counting money and cashing checks in it was a horrible job and um, then at lunchtime I'd go for a walk and I'd look at like a a vision board I'd made on my iPod Touch. Of How like, old were you then? 2013, so I was 25. So I was yeah. already three years in yeah. uh, to run the business. Or I'd sometimes make sales calls on, on my lunch break. Yeah. And it was half an hour lunch break. So you try and have your lunch and do a sales call. Yeah, yeah. And get back to your desk in half an hour. Got to hurry up. <laughs> um, so I just made my own little world where I'm going to get there. I'm not quite there yet and I know I'm not like 10% of my mind knows I'm not but 90% of my mind knows I'm going to get there mm. and then you know less than a year later from 2013 to the end of 2014 I had that giant gym mm. with AstroTurf and everything else and then I built that up to over 100 clients and yes as I said it, you know it burnt me out along the way but I think that is the story of having big success isn't it mm. it can no, be it is. It is. two sides of a coin so yeah make your own Make your own so strategy. And a lot of yours came from it. visionary, didn't it? Really, like yeah. let's be honest. Back at you know yeah. work at your first job, like or you know or that that job that in that story there, like you were thinking about this big thing, and because yeah. you kept your eyes on the prize, yeah. it become more of a reality. Yeah, I think that the the downside is I never asked for help, and so yeah. I thought you had to struggle to get there. Whereas if I'd maybe had a business partner and a business coach mm. and paid some money, you know, invested like couple of thousand in the first place or taken two years to just work at the bank and mm. not have a and you know do overtime and try and become a, you know a bit of a manager and get more money and stack it all up to one side and then open a gym it would have been a much more that rapid ascent. Smart though, doesn't it? yeah but it does though, doesn't it when you're yeah. that age it's like uh, you... yeah 21 22 i'm starting a gym unless tomorrow you told, yeah with, unless you were told that yeah yeah it's funny though because you know you, you say you never had any help or anything i didn't have any help and i and i you know i look back now and i'm glad i never had any help because I'm, I, you know what? It's, it's the one thing I'm always proud of is I never had a bank loan or, or anybody giving money or anything to set my gym up, and it was all like it was all through the fact of I just wanted to do it. Just graft, didn't it? Yeah, you know. I mean, obviously, I took out the COVID one not long ago because it was everyone did, didn't they? It was just, you know. But other like other than that, I literally never had any help with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's something I, yeah, something I reflect back to and be, I'm proud of. Yeah, you've done great, mate. You've done great, and and I think something that it's something that's a, a gift from experience isn't it like mm. you know I know lads who are 21 now who talk to me about starting gyms and I'm like if you were going to do it like I would do it this yeah. way or and they don't listen to you no. and I never feel bad I think I wouldn't have listened to me when I was 21 like no. fair play like go and smash it for yeah. go and struggle do what you think's right yeah, yeah. Like, absolutely struggle for three or four years because it's not a bad thing you're going to yeah. learn so much about who you are and how to sell and how to market and how to run a business that literally after that you could run any business mm. like I could run that car garage next door I know I can yeah. it's just from having to run a gym yeah yeah, yeah I wouldn't know anything about it's, cars but you can it's painful though isn't it that the, 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 some of the mindsets of this day and age do you know what I'm saying like because I actually had a guy on the phone that we also 
as you know, I've done a bit of like business mentoring and stuff. It's a business that I set up and I, and I started. Um, I've took multiple people on, and then as they as they've come to the end of their like contract with it, I've not pushed it as much. So it's like in the background. Yeah. But I actually had a, a sales call with someone a couple of weeks ago, um, and, and he actually didn't end up pursuing it. And he, and he said he had the money and everything to, to do it, but he says I spoke to my mum and she thinks I shouldn't do it. And it's like okay. So why does she think you shouldn't do it? <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, she just thinks it's too much of a risk. And it's like, okay, so you are currently, I mean, he was charging like £15 an hour to be a coach at a gym, and they was telling him that he couldn't charge more than that. Do you know, you know what I'm trying to say? And that yeah. whole mindset of like that, that he thinks that's acceptable. Yeah. It's like insane. It's like, and obviously the, 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 the stuff that we know and, and, and the, the, the stuff I can help him develop with, it was too much of a risk. It's, you're literally trying to create a different identity for yourself mm. and other people will still see your old identity. Yeah. So when when I quit the bank, 10 of my clients left the same month after I quit the bank. So I was working yeah. my four-week notice period. I was like, shit, you know, I, I'm fucked. I'm going to have to, like, you know, pull my notice back out of the, yeah. of the, of the, uh, the in-tray. Um and I took a three grand loan out to pay for the business coach for the next couple of months. And Sarah was so angry, like we were arguing in the kitchen. And I just, I, I, I normally am quite, I wouldn't say a pushover, but I normally am like, I'll compromise on things. Mm. But on this, I said, look, I'm not happy. I want to do the gym full time. I don't want to be in the bank anymore. I'm quitting. I'm going to loan three grand and I'm going to pay it back through getting more clients and growing the business. And yeah. it's going to be like, I think it was like 175 quid a month loan payment. Yeah. And uh, and I think it was, I don't know, 1,500 quid revenue. So maybe 900 pounds uh, was in my pocket every month mm. from the gym. Yeah, then yeah, half the clients left. So then I was like, I was just about being able to pay the rent. And then... Uh, so that was December 2013. By March 2014, it was making five grand a month, mm. and I was having like two grand in my pocket, and I'd easily pay the loan off. And it was on track to start scaling then. Mm. And then Sarah was like, "Fair play, like yeah, you stuck, stuck, you stuck two guns, yeah. and you've actually done it." And the fear of not having a job that Monday morning and having like to make sales is a great driver. Like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. Massive driver. But that's the thing, isn't it, where like for some people that's not a driver. Yeah. You know, um, my therapist said this the other day and she was on about how, I'm trying to think how to word this now to say it the right way, but she's on about how like I, I, I'm clearly a person that, that from the fear I achieve more, but then obviously some people from the fear they achieve less. That and makes sense. Yeah, but it's true though, isn't it? And, and there's so many people in that situation. It's like, it's like when the pressure gets turned up, some people fail because... Don't you think you find it... out if you really want it though? Like some people might fail when the fear kicks in because it wasn't what they were supposed to be doing in the yeah, first place Yeah, but there anyway. is that question, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. But then I also believe as well... I don't know. I also believe that there's some people that just don't have that gene. It's got to be. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I mean, do you, know, do you know what? It's really funny because I'm actually going back on something I used to always say. But I you think know, it's a curse having this. I don't want it. <laughs> I want a normal yeah, job. I yeah. <laughs> don't have to run a business. Yeah. And, and I want to be happy just doing just a, a general normal job. Yeah. yeah. Not putting anyone down. But like, if you can make like 25 grand a year, work nine to five, four days a week, go home and be happy with your wife and kids. Yeah. Like, why do I need to achieve more all the time? Yeah. And that's why I've tried making up. I've totally interrupted you, and I've forgotten what you're no, on. No, 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 no. But no. that's why I try and think like what my goals used to be was about ego, and money, mm. and outward expression of success. And now my goals have become personal development, not self development, but actually being part of an organisation that will develop me. So like where I work now, um, I was working on the rigid lorries, and then I've done the articulated vehicles, mm. and then they also had. 16 foot 2 biggest trailer you can drive without having the abnormal load thing on yeah and it's got a rear steering axle you have to do additional training to that yeah and i was in a meeting and suddenly my hand shoots up oh i'll pl i'll, I'll do, do the it. i was like what are you on about so, you know so now i'm driving those crazy things yeah but again that's another challenge for you isn't another it another challenge and yeah. i think yeah it's about and and also it's about having work life balance which i never had before 
and I realised you've got to go 80% in all areas. So mm. you've got work, you've got your relationships, your mindset, and your health. Mm. And so when I was going 100% on work, how much have I got left for those other three areas? Zero yeah. percent, right? Yeah. But weirdly, if you go 80% at work, you can have 80% in your relationships, you can have 80% in your mindset, and you can have 80% in your health. Yeah. So it's it's been a challenge for my ego to, to step back and go, you know what? I'm not going to be the best firefighter or lorry driver or gym owner in the world, but if I can be happy and make a difference in people's lives and not get myself into debt along the way, brilliant so that's 80% mm. relationships I'm not going to be like Casanova super romantic but if I can you know have an intimate moment with with my girlfriend a couple of times a week mm. and not have that many arguments 80% health yeah, no I agree jump, health I'm not going to be world's strongest man but if I know I can deadlift 240 now and then and kind yeah. of throw it down with some stronger people I'm happy with that yeah. if I can run a half marathon I'm happy with that that's that balance of life isn't yeah. it ultimately and then if you achieve those four areas you're actually in top one percent of of high achievers anyway because people are usually so unbalanced mm. you see loads of like divorces in we were talking before special forces mm. um soldiers i know you want to talk about my dad mm. <laughs> and uh and things like that so when you go all in on one area it's obviously essential to achieve success in that area but it leaves a bit of a trail of failures in other areas mm. so it depends how you look at someone to determine if they're successful or not as well yeah and quite often when you're planning your life or what you think is going to be a life and when you're growing up as such your 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 understanding of success is very different isn't it because you think it's almost totally material isn't yeah, it yeah it is oh you know what and, it, and i think it's only going to get harder for certain people in the day and age we're in right now without sounding like an old old twat saying that but like you, you know like for the people that are being well, or the people that are growing up now, sorry, in this day and age that we're in at the moment, everything is material, isn't it? And it's actually a real sad thing to say. Because of social media, you mean? Yeah, just, you know, it's just all about how you look and what you... Yeah, how do you convey on Instagram that all my friends think I'm a decent person? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. All, all, my, all, all his friends think he's a twat. <laughs> yeah. You can't tell. Yeah. You can only perceive. And so you've got What's to be delivered. careful what you're perceiving as well, yeah. 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 It's crazy, isn't it? Let's let's talk about your dad because I was ho I was holding him back, um, but your obviously your dad is ex. I don't know what you're gonna say here. Ex SAS. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know when we look at the elite of the elite in the army, I'm still yet to shake your dad's hand. I've never never come up and see him. I, I know I should. I really should. Have, but I've never I've never had the privilege to meet him yet. But um, but no like. What was it like for you? And uh, you sort of mentioned it earlier on. Obviously, I know only the surface level of it yeah. from our friendship and stuff. But why? Why was it hard growing up with your dad? And when you say it was hard, what was hard? What What was happening? Okay, I don't know if it was hard growing up with my dad now, but at the time it felt hard. But in Good hindsight, you. I can go. You know what? Maybe I was an annoying teenager myself, or maybe I didn't realise what he was going through at work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you don't as a child, I suppose. No, it's not your job to do that as a child, is it? Yeah. So from like naught to five, grew up in Germany on a military camp, mm. um, and my dad was an officer in the Royal Signals then, so that was after he'd left the SAS. I'm joking, he was Signals. Yeah. We've got to give him some stick now. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so that was all I'd known was like living in a German city and going to an international school for my first year of school and so that was kind of cool and like you know I'd go and see my dad at work and he'd be in charge of like these Land Rovers and he was doing loads of mountain exercises and it was like everything was cool like your yeah. dad's your hero isn't he yeah and then probably on till about he left the army in 97 or 98 I think after doing 30 years mm. And then he got really depressed and he went into telecommunications and tried to do like, you know, officers go and do the corporate thing, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he joined as a private. So he didn't join, go to Sandhurst and then do that. He like worked his way up from private to mm. join the SAS and then left the SAS because I think 
they used to make it that you had to leave the SAS after a few years and yeah, that, that, go back to I your think unit. that's still in place. Is it? I, I'm pretty sure it is. You might know different, but yeah. Because um, so they basically say, I'm, I'm pretty sure the rule is you either, you're going to die soon or you get out. Yeah. And they'd rather you get out. So I don't know how long he did, but it was like, I don't know, around seven or eight years or something. Mm. And then they sent him back to the signals and then he was became an officer and then he kind of worked up then. And that's kind of around where I was born. Um so that was really cool up until probably being 10 11 ish when he left the army then he got a bit depressed i think and then he was working in red it's like near birmingham like mm. more of a corporate job so he was traveling a lot because we lived in south wales you commute like an hour and a half each way mm. to, to his job um and he just was like just shouted just argued with my mum but i think they weren't happy in their relationship when you're a kid you don't really um, you don't know what's going on, do you? No. But I remember from like, we went on a family holiday to the Isle of Man, which is not <laughs> not an exotic location, and they argued so bad the entire way through, like it was just miserable. I'm just like crying. My sister, older sister, she was crying. Like we we're like, what? The, this isn't a family holiday. Mm. Me and my sister were like walking down the beach in the rain, like together, you know, ten and thirteen years old. I don't know what my parents were probably arguing or making <laughs> up. <laughs> don't say it. <laughs> And uh, after that, I said, I'm never going on, never going on holiday with you ever again. You know, for a 10 year old to say that, it's wow. like a. Oh, you you actually said that? that? I actually said that, yeah, and I never did. And then um, I remember being like 15, I thought, as soon as I'm old enough, I'm leaving home. I just can't deal with like the really? arguments. And so they were still together when they stayed together. Stayed really? together. Yeah. And then when I was 16, he went, he got made redundant, thank God, and he went back to doing more military type work so then he did private security contracting in um iraq so he's in baghdad from 2003 mm. for a while and then he went to bahrain i can't remember the dates entirely um and then he was just working overseas like six months on two months off something like that so mm. i hardly saw him from like 15 onwards and when he was back it was like almost like he was like thrust back into the the, the daily rhythm of things and he mm. was was kind of cool, I suppose, from like, from when I was like a bit older. But I realised when I was older, like now, I realised that he's always treated me like a team member and an adult. Yeah. Even from being like six, seven years old, and he'd he's called Anthony, so he's Tony and I'm Ant, but he'd always call me Tony Junior. Yeah. And you know th all the positives. He he'd set up like jungle patrol courses in in our little field. Mm. Or he'd throw me out of the oak tree with like a harness on. I'd be abseiling down an oak tree and just mad stuff that like probably normal dads don't do. Yeah. That would be how he would kind of bond with me. Yeah. And also I realised if I give him a load of shit and banter, he fucking loves it and he like gives it me back. So now I'm like, oh, maybe I wasn't hard enough as a kid. Yeah. Maybe he didn't mean it the way it was coming across. But I remember also being miserable, 13, 14 year old kid anyway. So net result is I. I, fe I felt at the time like I didn't really have a dad from probably 8 to 16. I just remember hating him or he was away on exercise or he was away commuting mm. or he was away, you know, in the Middle East working. And then from going to unit at 19 to about 25, 26, I hardly saw him, maybe saw him once a year because he was still working abroad. Mm. And then he got divorced from my mum in 2011. Then he moved to the Philippines. Um... And then he married a Filipino lady, so my stepmom Irene, who we get on with and everything. Yeah, I remember you saying. Um, they yeah. just become her and her daughter have just become British citizens, which is a really? bloody hard process. Yes, and they all live in the world now. Like we're all, you know, everyone gets on now. But going through all that, I suppose, I never really looked at it as a massive negative. I just thought I don't have a dad. But where yeah. I would struggle, and still now, as I see like someone's got a nice dad or like a, a soft caring dad and I think mm. oh I wonder what that's like mm. but then I also think maybe I'd be a little bit of a bitch if I didn't have you know yeah. a crazy hard dad yeah. who's a bit psychopathic and always would like just push me to do more and more and more like he, he'd maybe see me play rugby once um, once a year let's say mm. but he'd be like fucking kill it <laughs> do you know what I mean so I think like and my my mum's dad was in the army as well. A very similar guy. Yeah. Um, very hard. Very much like no nonsense. Farm working bloke. And I was getting bullied when I was um, year seven at school. I was getting bullied like really badly. And 
I got like beaten up on the bus one day and and I got off the bus like two black eyes and my granddad and my dad were like right come up to the gym and my granddad had this gym like a little shed garage gym and uh, there was a heavy kickboxing bag in there and my dad held the bag and George my granddad was like right this is how you kill someone with one punch and t- I was like year seven so those two like ex-army blokes were like teaching me how to kill people and then started lifting weights in the garage gym like the old York bench yeah, and the yeah. York cable machine and the old those horrible flies and leg extensions that were attached to the bench yeah. um, and that's, that's what got me into training was like I was getting bullied badly then I went up to Merthyr in the valleys and I went to this boxing club called Dallas Dallas Amateur Boxing Club and they had a few Welsh champions out of there and I learned to box and the next time those bullies picked on me, like I nearly blew a hole in the bus, kicking them out of the <laughs> of the school bus door. How did that feel to do that? Scary. Like how old were you then? So I was like eleven or twelve. But did you feel like? Because, I mean, we're not saying violence is the way, right? But did you not? You got to stand go, up to bullies. But this though. is it, right? Yeah. Did you not then go? I am not that person. That, do you know what I'm trying to say? You must have felt some like. Is proud the right word? Because you just kick someone's head in. But do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, you've just overcome being no. I, I probably felt more scared. I was like, oh, tomorrow they're going to be more of them, right. and they're all going to like gang up on me. But they never did. So I suppose eventually, not, not in the moment, but eventually I realised lifting weights and being hard is good. Yeah. And so it's not surprising that almost exactly ten years later, I owned a garage gym and was and um, was teaching young rugby players how to. You know, be hard and, and, <laughs> and kill tackle the crap out of people. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's that was a pivotal moment for me, which I wouldn't have had if it wasn't for my, you know, the male role models in my life being from the military. Mm. And it's not that they're lunatics; it's they're just they've just had a different life from other people, and it's totally normal yeah. in their world to do that. So, that's the world that I'm from, if you if you like. Mm. And I think I'm a very introverted person. A very confident person, which you wouldn't think go together, but that's from having that, you know. Yeah, but it's knowing when to switch, isn't it? Yeah. I've yeah. got I've got a, one of my mates, Callum. He's 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 very very much like that. He's a massive introvert, probably too much of an introvert sometimes. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Like I'm like, is he okay? But he's actually that calm with himself. But then he, he's also such a massive leader. Yeah. You'd actually really get on with Callum. He's one of my neighbours. But yeah. But yeah, he's. But that's the thing, isn't it? I think you just know when to switch, don't you? And you're good at both both roles. You know when you're drained, yeah, and I need to be on my own for half a day or for a couple of hours, yeah. yeah. You see, I struggle with that so much. Like, yeah. it, it's something I'm still trying to manage and understand. But you're quite extrovert, aren't you? But that's so the thing. So, so, so I you get, need people so I to need, charge up. Yes, I need people to actually recharge as opposed to on my own. So if I'm exhausted and I then all of a sudden spend time on my own, I then get depressed. Yeah. You know, because I don't feed off being alone yeah it's actually quite um yeah i don't know it's quite a sad thing to admit and and, and to to how to, to how to be but it's also a fact of matter like and some people like that aren't they it goes um, in waves surely you can't be happy all the time no of course no but it's just yeah it's my it's something i've recently realized and something i'm managing now yeah but no mate i really like obviously really appreciate everything we've been through today um and just to sort of like wrap up on you know on, on this, where can people see you? Um, where can they contact you? And also, what can you? What can, what are you delivering as a service now? Because obviously you've got the lead, leader lifestyle stuff, haven't you? That's your that's that's mainly you, isn't it? You're you know you're not going to go and pick a pallet up for someone. Yeah, you <laughs> know you, you need lorry do. services. <laughs> you <laughs> might do. So raw strength gym is the best place. Raw strength gym. Yeah. On all platforms. There's videos from 10 years ago. You can have a laugh at like young me trying to do YouTube videos. Uh, at Antshaw Coach on Instagram and then at The Leader Lifestyle on Instagram and uh, and on Apple Podcasts as well. Yeah. So, yeah, just have a listen. I try and not really have a service with that. I just try and put out lessons and things yeah. I think would be helpful. Yeah. yeah. But there's a lot of good... I mean, I've listened to quite a few of your podcasts, but there's a lot of good content there, isn't there? Just real-life people as well. I suppose I got fed up with trying to compete with other people, social media and content or whatever, where I feel like I've got a lot of things to offer. Mm. I just don't offer it unless people kind of ask. So if anyone genuinely wants help, I'll, I'll ask. Yeah. Um, they can ask, I mean. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I'm ha- 